Tonight we're in Glasgow. If Labour is to recover in Scotland, it needs to win seats here. So what's the mood in our biggest city? Let's find out. Welcome to Debate Night. Debate Night is the only show in Scotland giving you the chance to ask the questions that matter to you, answering them on our panel this evening. The leader of Scottish Labour and MSP for Glasgow, Anna Sarwar. Anna's trained as a dentist and has been a member of the Labour Party for almost 25 years. He succeeded his father, Mohamed Sarwar, as an MP for Glasgow before being elected to the Scottish Parliament seven years ago. From the SNP, Alistair Allen is the MSP for the Western Isles. Alistair was elected 15 years ago and was a Scottish Government Minister until 2018 most recently Minister for International Development and Europe. He joined the SNP aged just 18 at the same year he decided to learn Gaelic. Also with us tonight, the judge on BBC Scotland's Home of the Year, interior designer Anna Campbell-Jones. After graduation, Anna relocated to Glasgow and before working in television, spent 20 years lecturing at Glasgow School of Art. From the Scottish Conservatives, Jeremy Balfour is MSP for Lothian and the party spokesperson for local government and social security. Jeremy launched the Scottish Conservative disability group earlier this year to promote the inclusion of disabled people at all levels in politics. And finally tonight, director, investor and business advisor Mike Souter. Mike started his career as a journalist. He was editor of Smash Hits before moving into commerce. You might recognise him, of course, from The Apprentice, where he's been the fearsome interviewer of the final candidates for the past decade. Please welcome them all to debate night. And of course, welcome to our studio audience here in Glasgow. Great to have you with us tonight and uh, good to have you watching from home as well. You can join in the discussion wherever you are at BBC Debate Night. If you want to give us a follow, BBC DN is the hashtag you need on social media. And our podcast will be available for you to listen to straight after the show. So let's get started. Our first question of the night comes from Billy Stevenson. Billy. Good evening, panel. Should the Scottish Government keep wasting public money on unbuilt ferries or get them built somewhere else cheaper? Thank you, Billy. Uh, Wellbeing Economy Minister Neil Gray admitted yesterday it would be cheaper to scrap the second ferry that is being built, more cost effective, and to build one uh, somewhere else and start again. He's not going to do that, although he says there's no blank cheque on all of this. You're across all of this as a minister for the Western Isles. How much do we spend on this, Alistair Allen? Well, everyone knows that far too much has been spent on this project. Everyone knows that there's been huge problems with it. But I live on an island, I represent islands, uh, and so I think the right decision was made because the government would have been faced with the choice of scrapping this ferry or not, not continuing to build her, uh, which would have left a two and a half year delay for uh, people in the islands who are desperate for more ships. So I think it was the right decision that was reached. And as far as I can see, other parties, uh, however reluctantly, accept that too. Um, everyone knows this has been a, a deeply problematic um, project, but it needs to happen because CalMac needs ships. No blank cheque. How much do you spend, though? Well, as I say, the, the, the commitment that has been made is to finish this ship, and uh, I look forward at to seeing it. At any cost? That. No, well, you said it's not at any cost. So th there are, as far as I know, there are limits that will be put on it. But I'm not privy to that, but he made a statement and he made clear that the ships have to be built. Uh, and that's why, as someone who represents islands, uh, most of my, my inbox is about ferries and about the lack of vessels that CalMac has, so the right decision was reached. Anna Sarwar, part of the reason we've got this problem is Labour didn't build any ferries it's when you not, ran I mean, the government I mean, in Scotland. It's, it, it's frankly not true, it, but it's scandalous, actually, what's happened at Ferguson, because it, this is two ferries that should have cost £65 million. We're now set to spend £300 million on these two ferries, and we still might not have the two ferries come the end of it. And one of the other reasons why it's particularly scandalous, of course it's particularly scandalous for those communities, particularly in the Western Isles, who don't have that infrastructure, they can't move to and from the mainland and, and to the island. It struggles getting supplies onto the islands, but also impacts local businesses, local economy, local jobs, because they can't get produce off the island to sell to the rest of Scotland, Would you pull the, the plug? rest of the UK, the rest of the world. I actually wouldn't pull the plug because I think it's really important that we build ships here in Scotland. And this is where I think the biggest scandal comes, is Scotland is famous for its shipbuilding industry. And we are instead have two ships being built at Ferguson's that have been massively over budget. And we're now outsourcing the building of our ferries, two more ferries, two in Turkey, I think two perhaps going to Poland. And that is costing jobs here in Scotland. So we've got to fix the mess 
That means getting this party, frankly, that has got financial mismanagement written all over it, not just how they govern their party, but actually how they govern our country. And let's invest in the procurement properly. Let's invest in the shipbuilding industry. Let's create the jobs here so we have the infrastructure here and support all our communities, including our island communities. OK, we're, we're in Scotland's great shipbuilding city of Glasgow here tonight. From the audience, lady in the front. Penalty clauses are going to be put in place for these ferry for these ferry companies for non-delivery because, as you've rightly pointed out, they're years behind. I, I myself have got relations who live in the Isle of Lewis, and those ferries that they currently have are constantly not constantly, but they're quite often off because of poor weather conditions or whatever. What, what's going to be f done to fix all of that so that they can get back to communicating with the rest of the mainland? Well, as I say, I live in that community, so I, I understand the point you're making and that the only answer to it is to build more vessels. And there are six major vessels on order and ten or nine uh, smaller ones will be coming further down the line. But how do we learn the lessons from this? I mean, we've got a trams inquiry in Edinburgh that is finally, after nine years, about to produce its report. How do we actually learn the lessons from this to make well, sure the, it doesn't happen again? The, the lessons in this are, are manifold, and there's been, there have been several parliamentary inquiries looked into them about the whole procurement process, about the, the nature of the, the company that was running the yard, and many, many other things. Um, but uh, yes, there are lessons to be learned. But uh, as I say, these two vessels have to be finished because the community I live in uh, and many others along the west coast of Scotland are crying out for services to be run. And at the moment, CalMac does not have enough vessels uh, if one of them is off service to run all the services on the okay. timetable. Let me just bring Billy back in, who asked the question. Billy, on you go. Yeah, just with millions of pounds over budget for these ferries, they're years behind. But recently we've started paying, we've just agreed a million pound a month contract for a ferry that actually left people stranded at the weekend in Arran and had to pay thousands of, thousands of pounds we spent on hotels and food, etc. Where's the bottom split coming? Where's the money coming from? Who's paying and for it? And, it's, and there's actually worse than that. So, actually, if you look at the Transport Scotland budget, they actually budget for the fines that are going to yeah. go to Calmac and have it budgeted on what the transport infrastructure is going to do to spend those fines. Actually, what should, be, what should happen is there should be genuine penalties, because you're right. Right now, we are giving hundreds of thousand pounds of bonuses to those that are failing at Fergus Marines rather than punishing them. And one way the government would learn its lesson is those fines shouldn't go back into the pocket of government. We should actually use those fines to support businesses on the islands that have lost income, whether that's hotel income or produce income, for example, the fishing industry, or perhaps some of the people that do the candles and such like for the spa facilities. That money should be going back to those businesses to support those islands. Because see, if we don't do it, the big problem you're going to have is people will leave those islands, those businesses will shut down, and those communities will be decimated. And that would be completely and utterly unacceptable. Mike Suter, if the individuals responsible for this were in front of you across the apprentice desk, what would you be saying to them? I, I mean, it is obviously an absolute fiasco that this has happened in the first place. And what is striking to me is the real lack of accountability here. If this was in any proper business setting, you would get those people in front of you who had let the business down so badly, you would properly call them to account. You would have a real budget going forward, and I find the fact that, that this is not a blank cheque but nobody can say how much it's going to cost, I think that's astonishing for any organisation at all. So I think it's the pragmatic thing to do, is to push on, because any delay, <clears throat> as other panellists have said, will decimate what is already a damaged economy on the island. Clearly, whoever's in charge has to say, this is how much it's going to cost, this is how long it's going to take, and then they have to be accountable for project management. Well, Lydia in the front row down here. There you go. I think the issue is actually bigger than just ferries. You mentioned trams as well, and you've mentioned lessons learned. Whether it's ferries, trams, rail or buses, we have a serious issue when it comes to accountability. We keep paying more in fares, yet when it comes to services, these are seriously declining and there's just a distinct lack of accountability across the entire transport network in Scotland. And we rely on it, given our geography, given how spread out our economy is, this should be something that is a priority and it just doesn't feel like it. Thank you. And man on the front row here. Yeah. I think most people want to understand actually what went wrong, which isn't really clear. I've watched numerous documentaries, read newspaper articles about it, but no one can seem to understand 
what actually went wrong. What went wrong? Was it a procurement issue? Because when they were interviewing some of the welders that were working at Ferguson's, and they said, that was never going to work. We were just told to weld chimneys on, so the guy that signed off at the time, with respect, could stand in front of them. But they said there was nothing in those chimneys, nothing. They would just, you might as well put them here. Yeah. So where did it fundamentally go wrong? Because otherwise, the next time you have a project, and your aim is to run much bigger economic things, you can't do this. So simply, where was the issue? Well, those same people in that same documentary, the shipyard uh, workers, um, pointed out as well that the, the company that was running at, at Ferguson's was claiming to be able to build two large vessels at once when it clearly wasn't. So there are failures around all of that. Um, which so is with a, respect, who believed them? Sorry? The who believed them? The you, you procured the contract. But this is my point. Yeah, well, there, 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 if I tell you I can build are, two ferries and you, and you don't check, and I say, of course I can there, build there two are, ferries. There are clearly failures around all of the business in that shipyard, around the relationship with government, around everything. I don't think... I am not here to... <laughs> I am not here and would not attempt to defend to my constituents mm. uh, the mess that there has been around Ferguson's shipyard. Um, but I do defend the decision to build... Is there an vessels. apology to be made to the people well, of there, there has Europe? Been, there has been an apology made by the government and others, um, and it's, it's well-deserved because I think everyone, everyone accepts that there's been a, a, a real human cost as well as an economic cost in not having the vessels that we anticipated. As I say, the vessels are now in order, and the real challenge is how to get through the next year or two in terms of services. Jeremy Balfour. I mean, I think the, 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 this is a, a classic example where Scottish government promised something really big, but absolutely failed to deliver it. And we see it over and over again, whether it's in regard to uh, shipbuilding, whether it's in regard to other services, other transport issues that you've mentioned. We see government saying, we're going to do this, we're going to deliver this. The, the First Minister goes along, gets a photo, gets a press release out, and then a few years later it goes wrong. Because there is no accountability there, and there's no one willing to stand up and say, we made a mistake, it was my fault, and I take responsibility. How would you have done it differently? Well, I think ultimately, the minister involved, the ministers who signed it off, have to be held responsible for it. They are the ones that made the decisions. They are the ones, and we have heard over and over again, Mr. saying, well, it wasn't my fault, I was on holiday, I didn't do that. And it's just no one's willing in this government, from what I can see, is to say, I made the decision, I got it wrong, it's my fault, and I will resign. And we've seen no minister resign over this. All we've seen is empty promises. And this is affecting our ability to do more, because we're spending money when we shouldn't be spending it. But more where we are, our island communities are immensely suffering. People can't get to hospital appointments. People can't get to see family. People can't keep their livelihoods going because visitors can't get to the islands. Yeah. And this is not going to have an impact just now. It's going to have an impact for years to come because people on our islands have simply been let down. And the situation is so bad now that a Scottish minister last week wouldn't trust our boat and had to hire a private one. And Lorna Slater hired a private boat because she didn't trust she could get there in regard sure to that. And I just think that sums up true. where we are with the government. Okay. All right. let, don't let, trust let me hear services. lots of hands up in the audience this lady in the black top. With respect to what Alistair was saying there about blaming the workers at Ferguson's, I think that's a shameful thing to say. I, I live... I the workers you at Ferguson's. pretty much did. No, I, I live in no, the no, area. No, 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 no. You I must were be clear. basically passing the buck and passing it down to the people no, that were no, actually working there. I have to be clear. I said the workers at and Ferguson's work... said the company were selling a, a false prospectus when they said they could build two ships. That's no criticism of the workforce. You made a comment about workers at Ferguson's, and I take offence with that. I live in the Inverclyde area. I see the impact it has on people uh, to see their jobs disappear like that. Uh, and what's even more terrifying is it's pushed a lot through the secondary schools. Let's go and be apprentice. Let's get 40 of you, 50 of you in Essex and make you go and be apprentices in this Ferguson shipyards. My sons have just have left high school. They are in further education. They had very firm ideas about what they wanted to do, but they were still being forced to go towards Ferguson and almost being made to feel bad for saying no I, I to go and work in Ferguson shipyards like it was this amazing place. I think and it is an amazing place purposes. for the workers that... Well, I'm going to say my piece, if you don't mind. I'm going to say my piece, if you don't mind. But um, I think it's shameful to... to 
pass the buck on to anybody else because the, government, right, the Scottish I, I, Government is very good at doing this. Clear that up, Alistair, what no, you were saying. I think we thought cross purposes here because I would defend the decision that the Government made to save that shipyard for all the reasons that you have given because of the proud tradition, because of the workforce. And as I said earlier, it was the workforce who pointed out some of the faults that there were in the whole process. But it's not the workforce's fault that things went wrong. All right, Anna Campbell-Jones. Well, you know, I'm, I've been on pretty much nearly every CalMac ferry making uh, Scotland's home of the year, so I have very strong affection for them. And, um, yeah, I mean, like this gentleman here, I just, don't, I just don't really understand it. I mean, my experience is building buildings, and you employ a contractor to build a building, and you have a contract, and if they don't deliver what they're meant to deliver on time to, that matches the drawings on the date that's agreed, then there's penalty clauses. And I don't understand how you can spend that amount of money without something that protects you. OK, let me go to the gentleman up there in the middle. Yes, on you go. We hear the word due diligence in the public. There doesn't seem to have been much in government yeah, when taking on projects. <laughs> gentleman in the Navy shirt here. Yes. Yeah, on you go. Oh, sorry, we talked about accountability and we talk a lot, obviously the questions about ferries. What about the NHS? We talk about spending money on hospitals and how many of those have gone in on time, on budget. And the answer is accountability across government contracts for all projects. The, the accountability is only through the ballot box. And I think we, the public, have got a responsibility to say, has the government actually delivered mm. on the promises in the right way, with the right budget, etc.? And there is accountability through the ballot box to say, did you do it right mm. or can somebody else do it better? OK. Your views on all of this from home. The hashtag is BBCDN on social media to get involved in the conversation. Let's go to our second question of the night, which comes from Isabel Macrossan. Isabel. Hi. Um, if Keir Starmer becomes Prime Minister, would the SNP go into government in coalition with them? Would uh, they be willing to? Thank you, Isabel. Um, Mike Souter, you know business is all about doing deals, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Anna Sarwar has been very clear so far that he wouldn't do deals with the SNP. Is that a mistake? I think that, uh, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Deals and, and working together makes the world go round. And so you have to find ways to compromise on those things. I think it's an, a, an entirely appropriate question to ask as a voter, which is, if I vote for a party, I'm voting for a manifesto, I'm voting for a set of promises. So how, if you don't achieve a workable majority, are you still going to deliver on the promises that you made me? Now, I think coalitions in politics um, have a bad name. Um, you only need to speak to the Liberal Democrats, um, who went into power expecting more power and ended up with less power um, down in England. Um, but both Scotland and England here have a very similar dynamic going on. There are administrations which have been there now for well over a decade. The polls aren't supporting them at the moment, and so therefore there are opportunities. And I therefore think it's a really relevant question to be asking any politician, so if you don't win outright, what will you do to still deliver? And to get a meaningful answer to that. And it's so good. With SNP, and it's like pff, okay. no way. Well, well, I wonder if the, the opposite. Okay, well, hang on a second. Let's well, hear from Anna. Well, let me give, his an, perspective un, let me give an unequivocal answer. Uh, no ifs, no buts, no deal, no coalition with the SNP. It's not going to happen. We, we are going all out. We are going all out to get rid of a Tory government. And frankly, the SNP want another Tory government because it's cover for their own incompetence. We just talked about SNP incompetence, and the reason why they want another Tory government is because they always hope another bit of chaos happens elsewhere and they never are held accountable for what they actually do in Scotland. So we are going all out to get rid of this rotten, morally bankrupt, eating on the tip of the tip to the government. If that's but the case, the reason why, why, why are the SNP councillors working with the Tory councillors in areas in but, Scotland? But the, but the reason why I think it's also important to say why ideologically it would not make sense for us to do a deal with the SNP is this is a political party that wants to walk out of Westminster. They do not want to see the United Kingdom work. Now, I don't think the United Kingdom is working for every part of the country. I don't think there's a majority in Scotland for uh, the status quo. I don't think actually there's currently a consistent majority in Scotland for either a referendum or either for independence. But there is an overwhelming majority in Scotland, and I actually think an overwhelming majority across the UK for change. And that's why we're going flat out for change. And Mary Black's already said this week, the SNP's deputy leader in Westminster, 
that it doesn't matter if the Tories win again. Mm -hmm. So it's very clear that if you want to get rid of this rotten Tory government, there is only one route for change, and that is voting Labour come the next general election. And my plea would be, of course we're going to go all out for a majority Labour government, but if we fall short of a majority Labour government, the SNP will face a very simple choice. No need for a deal, a very simple choice. They can either vote in a Labour government or they can vote in a Tory government. And I dare them to vote in a Tory government and see how Scotland reacts. Okay, let, let me hear from the audience. Uh, the gentleman on the end of the row there first. Yeah, on you go. Yeah, uh, as a lifelong Labour supporter, I've got a real problem with what you're saying, Anis, with Keir Starmer. He is not a Labour I remember. To me, for me, Keir Starmer is Tory light for me. He's not left wing in the old sense that I remember left wing. He is not an alternative to uh, the Tories. He's slightly different, and that's my problem. I'd love to vote Labour, but I've got a problem with it now. No, and, I, and I thank you for your honesty. But what, what, what I would challenge back is, is I don't think we can compare what's happened over the last 14 years under this Conservative Party to anything that the Labour Party believes in. This is a Conservative Party that gave out over £4 billion of contracts to their pals. Are we honestly saying that we don't want to get rid of that Tory government? This is a Tory party that has brought in anti-trade union laws to try and stop strike action happening across the country, a bill that we would repeal and we would impose a new deal for working yeah, people that, across that the country. That man knows all this, Anna, but he's rights. not yet convinced. Of That's course, the point and, he's making. And, and I take that point. And our job, our job between now and the next general election, is of course to try and tell you why we think both the SNP and the Tories deserve to lose, but actually that's the easy part of politics. The harder part is persuading you why we deserve to win, and, and the promise that we and the promise we make absolutely and the Clearly promise between and the, the promise two parties, that I make, and I don't see it. The promise that I make is that I'm going to spend every single day between now and the next general election persuading you about why Labour deserves to win. That's partly around a new deal for working people. It's partly around a proper windfall tax to the oil and gas giants so we can bring down people's bills. Far too many people are struggling to get by. It's about getting rid of the non-dom status so we can invest money. Okay, we don't want the whole manifesto the right now. But, but, yeah. Yeah. But, but, uh, but I'm glad you think that, Stephen, because it demonstrates that we are coming up with the ideas to deliver that change and we are not complacent for a moment. All the right, next election is not decided yet. We've got work well, to do to persuade It will be people. decided by people in this room and elsewhere. Lady in the front row here. Yeah, it was interesting what you said there. You're, you would never have a coalition with the SNP, but I can give an example just now. South Lanarkshire Council Labour run I went into bed with the Tories and, lived, and they're upping the price of people hiring parks for young kids to be able to develop, get fit, all the basics that we have in, in terms of our health and trying to keep people forward. So how can you honestly sit there and say that you wouldn't get to bed with the SNP, but you would get to bed with well, the... Well, we wouldn't because Just it's, briefly, it's really Anna, clear so get that the, the next general election is going to be a choice. You're either going to have a Labour government or a Tory government, and we'll be going flat out to get rid of a Tory government right across the UK. And you as a Labour government will be able to beat the Tories just Absolutely. Now. All right, let and me get around the rest of the audience. To make it Man with the blue shirt. Uh, hang on a sec. Man with the blue shirt at the back. You're saying that... Uh, no way, uh, any shape or form, would you go into a coalition with the SNP. But if it came to the choice that the only choice that you have to become the next government is going into coalition with the SNP, you're not going to tell me you're not we going to accept to it. Okay. So you're, you're not going to go into government then? You'll no, just no, no, we don't need to do it. We don't need to do it because if we fall short, so we're going flat out for a majority Labour government, but if we fall short and we are a minority party and have an opportunity to form a minority government, then other political parties have to make a choice. Who do they want to see in power? And they will have to choose, the SNP will have to choose, do they want Keir Starmer to be Prime Minister or do they want Rishi Sunak to be Prime right. Minister? Okay. That's the choice yeah, but, they will right. face. Well, 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 hang on a second, I want to hear from the other side of the fence on this. Alistair Allen, from the SNP's point of view, you want to do business, don't you? Well, the SNP will always work against the idea of a Tory government. And the SNP does that not just because the Tories are an appalling government, but also because the Tories represent a government that Scotland hasn't voted for, a party Scotland hasn't voted for since 1955. And the great thing about voting, of course, for independence is that you get rid of unelected governments in Scotland, not just once every so often, but permanently. Scotland always gets the government it votes for if Scotland votes for its own government all the time. And I find it really curious that whereas other people like the SNP are very happy to, to work together to make sure that the Tories um, don't, uh, don't prosper. For, for the Labour Party, the priority 
is to talk about the untouchable nature of the SNP. And I just find that very, well, very weird. They, they say they won't work with you, but you say you won't work with the Tories. That's just politics, isn't it? Yeah, but that's a, that is politics. That's a decision. But we are prepared to work with other parties to see the end of the Tory party. But for the, the Labour Party, the priority, is to, the priority is to say that you're the SNP position again. are untouchable. But you're changing your position again. Who do you agree with? Do you agree with Stephen Flynn, Mary Black and Hamza Youssef when they say it doesn't matter if you have a Tory government again? Are you saying it does matter now to get well, rid what, of a Tory what, government? The, the point that's being made there is that if you, if you continue with the set, set up that we've got just now, you will regularly get unelected governments and Scotland will regularly face that situation. What makes a difference? And the point they're making is what really they're makes a difference. About the next election. What really makes a difference is if you vote for independence and you get the governments you vote for so, every right, single time. It's these time. people in our, this room who have the votes, let's find out what they think. Man at the back. You just said there that Scotland has an, uh, had voted for uh, the Conservatives or hadn't voted for the Conservatives, so we've got an unelected government. I didn't see on my ballot paper for the last uh, Scottish elections a coalition of the SNP and the Greens. And having seen some of the policies that the Greens are now inflicting on yourself, um, I think that was maybe an error of judgment. Thank you. Man in the white polo shirt here. Yeah. Stephen, you mentioned you didn't want to hear all of uh, the Labour Party's manifesto. I think that was pretty much it, because we've heard precious little, actually, from Keir Starmer in the run-up. Like. Sure we've heard very little from Keir Starmer in the run-up to what is inevitably going to be an election within the next 18 months, less than two years, certainly, that we're going to hear. And what you indicated as well, Anis, in terms of saying we either get, uh, we either vote uh, Labour or we get a Tory government, doesn't that perfectly illustrate the issue that Scotland has in terms of it's one party or another, there's not a, a range of choices that we could, we could get and the gentleman there talking about Labour being uh, Tory light, that's the issue I think in terms of what Mary Black etc were saying because actually there's not much of a difference that we can see at this stage between right, the I Labour Party and the Conservative yeah. Party that exists okay. in the I want more views from the audience, this is really crucial what people think here. Gentlemen in the spectacles. I'd like to come back on the gentleman over there and behind me um, saying that Keir Starmer is Tory, li Tory light. Um, this is basically only helping the Conservative Party. The left of the Labour Party had their shot. They had two general elections. They failed. They had the worst result for since 1930-something. So it's going to somebody else. There's a huge difference between Keir Starmer's Labour Party and uh, the current Conservative Party. We have just crumbled. And I think the SNP are going to crumble at the next election. The Tories are going to crumble. So I can't see any prospect at all of there being a coalition between the okay. SNP and Labour. I think it's just another Tory campaign. Thank you. Anna Campbell-Jones. I don't know, I'm just speaking as a, as a punter, really. I think just kind of get really tired of hearing politicians, whether it's at Holyrood or whether it's in Westminster, and it's like we're just leapfrogging from one campaign to another, and it'd be really great if the two main parties, the, quite overlapping progressive ideologies in theory could find their points of similarity instead of the points of difference and actually do some stuff, do some running the country stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen down here. I'm right in thinking that Labour or Conservative wouldn't go in coalition with SNP because they would say on condition of going with SNP I want independence and I want a referendum and no Conservative or Labour Party will ever stand for that. Jeremy Balfour? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting. I mean, I think the last proper election we had here in Scotland, so the last by-election, uh, the Conservative vote went up dramatically. We took a seat off another party. So, you know, I'm not sure we're going to end up with a Labour uh, government, hopefully, in a year's time or 18 months. But I think there's three points Anna's does need to address. I mean, firstly, I'm not sure his English colleagues are quite on the same message. We're hearing very mixed messages from shadow cabinet colleagues. They come up here and they talk about being nice to the SNP. So you I do think, I, I do think we need to... I, I, it's true, and it's happening. <clears throat> the second thing is, Anna says, you know, no deal, no deal, no deal. Just go back over a year ago for the local government elections, Anna said, Labour will do no deals with the SNP to form local authority councils. And we have. We have done deals across Scotland. So I'm not sure that this guarantee is actually worth <coughs> the paper it's written on, because we saw as soon as there was a sniff of power within a local authority, Labour did deals with the SNP. And then thirdly, look at the Labour voting at Hollywood. 
90% of time Labour vote with the SNP. They're the ones that push through legislation that the majority don't want to see. So they're already in bed together in Holyrood. And actually, <coughs> the danger is we get this promise now, but if it's a sniff of power, I'm pretty convinced we we'll should take a referendum. What, what this perfectly demonstrates for you in the form of Jeremy and Alistair is this is the same old, same old game, two sides of the same coin, both loving the politics of division, both loving the politics of chaos, no, what, both quite, wanting to talk up deals. Hang on a second. And, no, 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 and who pays the price? No, and it's what deals have you done? Jeremy, let him finish his point. point. And who pays the price? OK, right but now, the question. One second, Jeremy. Answer the question. No, I've answered it very clearly. No deals. No, local authorities. What have you done? And there's no deals in local authorities either. But the big point here is... Right now, our country faces a twin crisis, a cost of living crisis, meaning there are mums up and down this country who are skipping meals in order to put food on the table for their kids. And NHS, the fault of a Tory party, an NHS crisis where people are missing out on life-saving treatment, the fault of an SNP government in Scotland. But you would much rather debate chaos, you'd much rather debate division, you'd much rather debate what's going to happen about stitch-ups right. rather than the biggest no, 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 in the country. No, 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 I don't know what the word is, but just I, I don't know Scuttered, who to vote for. Yes, the because there's so much division between everyone, and you can't agree anything between each other. I wouldn't want to see any of you in government right now, just because I'm so disillusioned by the whole thing. You know, the first question was about incompetence. We've seen that Westminster and in Edinburgh, and just you know, there's so much division. There's so it's just so difficult for people to know who to, who they would want to vote for. That it's just it, you know, we need to get better at this okay, because is it's that not what working. we feel about this lady in the blue down here. Yes, I think that I think what what the, the apprentice person said. Sorry, I'm so sorry, <laughs> I forgot your name, Mike. Um, I think what Mike said <laughs> in terms of doing deals. I think there needs to be way more. A, a sort of middle ground, and that has to be found by, by all of the parties, not just by one party. And this constant confrontation, it's just putting everybody off and it's getting nothing done. It's much better if you can find what's the common path, what's the quickest way they can do it, and how many bodies can we get on board. Use the best of the talent. Let's not get into, I said, he said. Thank you. And man in the black, thank you. It's surely a numbers game with Westminster, because I think this key point's been missed. The SNP have got two choices after the Westminster election. They've got to vote with Labour or vote with the Tories. That's it. They, they simply haven't got enough seats to do anything else. And it's what people are missing in this. So the SNP's choice is you can abstain from votes, which means you're not representing anyone, or you can vote with the Tories against Labour. But surely Starmer's majority only has to be one. Because in terms of the other politicians, none of them are going to work together. So is that right? Starmer needs the slimmest of majorities for you to form a government, effectively. We, we, we want to go all out for a majority, but I think there's a wider point, which is I, I think many of the comments from the audience are absolutely right. Our politics has got deeply polarised, and you've got deep, deep divisions between political parties. You've demonstrated it today. But actually, I've got a much better view of the wider public. I don't actually think those deep divisions necessarily exist amongst the public. Well, the public course, seem to want you to work better together. But that's I, what they're I, I saying. Think that, I think that this, that's a loaded, that's a loaded <laughs> term in many, in many a political debate. But the challenge you have is, is you know, this, this division has sustained a Conservative Party government for 14 years and sustained an SNP government for 16 years. And the challenge I would make to people is, Alistair's mentioned independence. What I'm saying to people is, independence is actually not going to be on the ballot paper come the next general election. And I am saying to people that have supported independence in the past, they may well support independence now, they may even think about supporting independence in any future referendum, is surely, we might disagree on, I don't support independence, I don't support a referendum. But I think a vast majority of us can agree that this country is crying out for change. All right, we Jeremy need change. Balfour. And let's build those okay, bridges. Hang on, so hang, on hang on, hang on. OK, I, Jeremy. I mean, there's a key constitutional question. You know, Alice is very upfront, very clean his party. They want independence. And that's the whole agenda, the whole being is what they're trying to preach. And I, you know, I don't agree with it, but I respect that. But come the next election, we've got to decide do we want to remain part of the United Kingdom or do we want to go down that road? 
And I am afraid what, you know, Anna did not answer the questions that I've asked about how we vote in Hollywood and what we did with the local authorities. And I, I am, don't think the I am, and I, 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 I am deeply worried, this point, I am deeply worried that if we end up with um, a minority Labour government or any form of Labour government, we will see a second referendum in that term. And that's why the only party that I said we will not in, under any circumstances, okay. have a second referendum. Well, the people don't want to ask that every, it, it, every, it, it, every, opinion, poll, every opinion poll tells us that people want you to you, fix the health service, to do the education. We are, you know, the point is, people had a chance, we didn't go for it. But Jamie, with respect. Okay. With respect. Okay. Okay. No, 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 no. Do you know what? To make sure that the union is... This, this, this is a very important... No, 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 no. This is a very important subject, but there are other things that people wanted to talk about here this evening as well. So we are going to park this, and I'm sure we will revisit it. We'd love to hear your views on all of that. The hashtag is BBCDN on social media. Let's go to our third question of the night, which comes from, and this was actually the subject we had most questions on tonight, David MacDonald. David. Hi there. With the after effects of the pandemic and the continuing squeeze from the increasing cost of living is the imminent introduction of the low emission zone in Glasgow and other cities the final nail in the coffin for city centre shopping, hospitality and nighttime economies. Thank you very much. We're about half a mile, I think, from the most polluted street in Scotland, Bath Street in uh, Glasgow. This low emission zone, which comes in, in two weeks' time here in Glasgow, other cities will follow, is intended to improve air quality. Anna Campbell-Jones, what do you think? Well, I think we'd all love our... We, we were talking earlier about the city and pride in where you live. Wherever your home is, you have pride in where that is. And for the air to be clean, for it not to be smelly in the city centre of Glasgow, I would have thought that would be good for, for businesses. And, um, but I think that what has to come along with that is better public transport, better services to support people not using their cars in the city centre. Is there enough awareness of it, the people you speak to, the people that you deal with? What's happening? Is a big change know. that's I coming up? I think there's a kind of, it's a slightly kind of hazy thing, like it's, it's coming, but like what's going to happen? I don't know. I, and I don't know, the whole electric car thing, that's just kicking the can down the road anyway, because that, they're not any, really any better for the environment than petrol cars. So it's about clean air, mainly. Um, and I think that has to be a good thing. Mike Suter. I mean, I think this uh, goes to show the, the difficult balance that you need to achieve when you use legislation to try and meet environmental goals. I think we can all agree that clean air is something that we should all be driving towards. But in the short term, there are real dangers, as the gentleman over there said, about, um, about decimating nighttime economies, um, about, about the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back when it comes to city centres and so on. I think the, the biggest danger with these things can be that it hits people, the poorest people, worst. Because they're the people who struggle most to update their cars. They're the people often who are the most entrepreneurial, who are trying to get in and out of the, the city centre at, at, at difficult times. Um, the long term is good. But I think, as Anna said, if you don't have the infrastructure there, mm -hmm to help those people who are otherwise going to struggle, then you're going to cause lots of unnecessary pain. I live in London, and in London we've had the low emissions zone mm. for several years now. And they take a slightly different approach to the one that Glasgow is going to approach, which is um, a bit like the congestion charge, you can pay to go in. It's a tax as opposed to a penalty, and I believe in Glasgow it's a penalty. If you drive in, then, then that's you, you're on, a, you're on a penalty timer at that moment. So I think pragmatically, it's the right thing to do, but if you don't put the underpinning resource behind it, then you're going to end up endangering the livings of people who can least afford it. Well, it's all going to be affecting uh, us here. Uh, gentleman in the yellow shirt there, what do you think? Uh, I manage a, a, Gla a Glasgow-based charity in Bath Street, no less, and we support people with acquired brain injuries at Headway Glasgow. And 60%, over 60% of the people we support come from the 10 poorest areas in Glasgow. Glasgow City is facing £22 million worth of cuts in terms of health and social care, including £2.8 directly from people's 
um, support packages. We support some of the most vulnerable people in society. I would have thought that Glasgow City would have had more important things on their mind at the moment. Yeah, good news for you, it's actually Hope Street that is the most polluted oh, street. That's a bonus. So there, there's a little bonus for you on that. Gentleman in the back row there. Oh yeah, on you go. Um, yeah, this just seems like a, just a sticking plaster from basically as a way of mm. meeting these targets but not having any political party being able to actually commit to like big transport infrastructure projects to be able to make people use better services to be able to help our environment. Thank you. And man here. I'd like to agree with the gentleman. It's not so much the issue of the zones themselves. I think we would all like to see a far cleaner city. Mm -hmm. But there is a lack of an alternative. I mean, we see in our transportation system the cuts to trains. So we're ultimately driving people out of the city. Alistair Allen. Well, just to say, Anna had mentioned and somebody else mentioned that we, we need to find things that people can agree on. Now, maybe we're not going to agree on all this, but I think what we can agree on is that COP26 in, in Glasgow opened all our eyes to the kind of carbon, carbon reductions that all of us are going to need to make in all of our cities, not just in Scotland, but throughout the UK. Um, and uh, I suppose we, we, we are going to have to find mechanisms. Whether you feel this is the right one or not, you're living in Glasgow, I'm, I'm not living in Glasgow. Um, we are going to have to find mechanisms that reduce the number of cars coming into the middle of our cities. Uh, it has to be done in a way that supports business. It has to be done in a way that uh, involves public transport solutions. Um, but increasingly, cities around the world are going to be facing this question and they're going to have to face it pretty soon. Jeremy Balfour? Yeah, I mean, we have a little consensus here. I mean, I actually agree with everything um, Alistair said there. I mean, all of us want clean air. Uh, it's, you know, it's good for our health. It's good for the environment. What concerns me is, is the infrastructure there now? I, I, mean, I don't live in Glasgow, I live in Edinburgh, we're bringing it in later on. But is there the bus services, you know, is there other ways that people can get around the city there? Uh, particularly for older people, particularly for those with disability. Um, you know, I hear a lot on social media about how the taxes are going to be affected here in Glasgow. You know, it's not just businesses that use taxes, it's often older people, it's people with disabilities. If they can't come into the city centre, they're not going to be used the services, they're not going to be used the charities, they're not going to be able to live the life that they want. So I personally you know, think we do need to leave it to local authorities to make the ultimate decision, but there has to be that infrastructure there so that the vulnerable, whether that's economically vulnerable or whether it's people who have got disabilities, older people, have still got that transport network that they can use safely to get in and out of the city. And I'm just not sure it's quite there yet well, in let, Glasgow. Let's find out. Lots of hands up in the audience. A uh, man in the black shirt. Yeah. I'd love to see politicians take a lead on this. I'm turning on the news. I'm seeing Rishi Sunak taking helicopters for an hour's train journey. I'm seeing Lorna Slater taking private uh, boats. Why can politicians not take a lead? It feels like we're getting punished, this low emission zone. Thank you. Gentlemen in the spectacles, yes. The Scottish Government plan to decarbonise the Scotland Railways. It's now pulled contracts and budgets to do this. Where do you stand with that? OK, uh, hang on. We'll come back to these. We'll just mop these up at the same time. Lady here, yes. Um, I was just thinking, I completely agree we need to put in these measures to combat climate change, and I'm just wondering um, what the SNP are doing to help um, people that are vulnerable and need to access services. OK. Um, how are they making it more accessible? OK, we'll come, ba come back on that as well. And lady down here in the spectacles, yes. Do you need to take a more holistic approach to infrastructure? So on top of improving infrastructure, having better infrastructure, mm. do we need to make improvements to the infrastructure that we already have in place? For example, the underground in Glasgow is fantastic, but the south side, it, there's no density of housing. It's mm. massively underutilised. Why is there no strategy to concentrate development and building, if there's property to be built, on the south side of Glasgow to make use of that amazing infrastructure that we've already got there and it is mm. massively underutilised? OK. Alistair, I'll come back to you on these points that were raised there, but Anna Sarwar, where do you stand on this? I, I think it comes back to the, the strategy point. Uh, look, and the principle is a correct one, but it's actually the wrong time to be doing this. And actually, we should be following the Manchester model where they've got a much more phased and longer term approach in, in terms of emergency. We can't hang around on I, this. I, look, can I, we? I get that. The challenge you have, though, is we've got businesses in the city centre of Glasgow that had to come through a pandemic, the shutdown, 
uh, the lockdown, the recovery from the pandemic, and then got thrown into a cost of living crisis where people don't have money to spend the same way they do, and the costs have gone through the roof for these businesses, whether that's their energy bills or indeed their staff costs or their supply chains. And what we're going to do with this failed model, I think, is we're going to force hundreds, if not thousands, of taxi drivers off the road. They're going to lose their livelihoods. We're going to have less people coming into our city centres. Footfall is already down at a Meaning footfall is going to fall even more. Meaning less people spending money in retail. Retail already struggling. Meaning more empty shops. Less people coming in to spend money in our hospitality venues, whether that be the nighttime economy, cafes, or indeed restaurants. Meaning more businesses going to the wall. Unemployment going up. And all of it is because we do not have a strategic plan, both for our city, but for the wider Scottish economy. We should have built the infrastructure, whether that be the rail, the bus, or the underground service. We haven't done it. Instead, we've got the, the low emission zone coming in first. At the same time, the underground closes far too early. You've got bus routes being cancelled. You've got fewer trains and fewer routes, all getting even more expensive in the time of a cost of living crisis. And Jeremy's absolutely right to highlight the impact on people with disabilities. But actually, one of the other big issues we've seen confronted in our city for the last two years is women feeling deeply unsafe when they're coming to and from our city centre. If you decimate our taxi industry, and you don't have the transport links, we're going to put even more women at risk, yeah. either those that are going to work or coming back from work, or indeed those going on a night out or coming back from a night out. It's not thought through. It will damage Glasgow's business. It will damage Glasgow's economy. And it's the wrong plan. And it shows a lack of coherent strategy, both from an SNP council, but also, tragically, from an SNP government. OK, the alarm on, the, <laughs> alarm on that man's phone has just gone off. So it's time to go to him, I think. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, my family runs a business, in the, uh, a takeaway in the south side of Glasgow, and we regularly get food delivery orders from the city centre. And the drivers that we employ, they, they've said to us that we can no longer work for you after the LEZ comes in because our cars are too old to go into the city centre and we cannot afford to upgrade them. OK, Alistair Allen, on that point and the other points that were made and about you know, the problems with public transport as an alternative. Well, if I can just pick up on the point first, yeah. that the, the very good point the lady made about the subway and what a great resource it is in Glasgow. And, of course, the reason why there are places on the south side of Glasgow that have a, a subway station and don't have a big population is because planning decisions by governments and councils in the past knocked down the communities that those, those, uh, those uh, subway stations were in to build a motorway through them. And... The, I think I would agree with the, the idea that we do need to have a vision for planning in those parts of Glasgow and similar parts of the country to make sure that the, the population and the house building and the infrastructure all match up. Because if we, if we make this, the kind of mistakes that people made in planning in the 1960s, not just in Glasgow, but many parts of the country, we will never meet our carbon targets. And to that man's family who now face, their business faces real problems because of this, what do you say? Yeah, well, I would, I would say I have a lot of sympathy there, and that comes back to the point I was making about any solution like this has to involve the public transport uh, solutions and it has to involve business. Um, uh, my understanding is that, as, as you pointed out, there will be certain types of vehicle that won't be allowed, particularly diesel vehicles, and that's probably not what you're referring to there, but I think particularly diesel vehicles won't be allowed into the town centre. But if it's not done with business, it won't work, obviously, and I think on that much we can probably agree. OK, uh, tonight we are in Glasgow. Next week on Debate Night, we're going to be in Elgin for the first time. The week after that, we're in Perth. So if you'd like to come along and be part of the audience for any of those shows, just go to the address that's on your screen right now, bbc.co.uk forward slash debate night. Click on the link. It takes you just a couple of minutes to come along and be part of the audience. It would be great to see you there. Let's go to our fourth question of the night, which comes from Bilal Anwar. Bilal. Hi. Is it fair that teachers have to put up with increasing levels of violence in classrooms across Scotland? Now, trade union leaders have been calling for urgent action and more to be done on classroom violence after a number of really, really unfortunate, nasty incidents around Scotland. Anna Sawa. Look, it's completely unacceptable. And actually, there's a responsibility, I think, largely, of course, on individual pupils, of course, on families, of course, uh, teachers uh, and those responsible for their classrooms. But actually, social media has been a really negative influence in all of this as well. The proliferation of violent incidents in our schools going unchecked, uh, running rampant across all social media platforms only, I think, exacerbates this problem. So we've got to put much, much more pressure on those social media companies to clamp down on those kind of incidents. Or you could take mobile phones out of the classroom. Would you do that? I, look, I think, there's a, I think there's a wider issue there around... I mean, I, I struggle to get devices out of my kids' hands uh, at home, never mind trying to get them out of their hands uh, in classrooms and in schools. But I think there's also a wider point, which is around mental health and CAM services. Uh, 25 young people 
every single day get rejected for CAMS treatment despite being referred by either a CAMS specialist in a school or their GP in Scotland. 25 every single day. And I think we have a mental health pandemic coming across this country if we do not get to grips with that. So, of course, get greater support for teachers, of course, more resources in the classroom, of course, more responsibility on families, more responsibility on social media platforms, but also we've got to get the infrastructure right around mental health services in the wider NHS because it's been neglected for far too long and too many children and families and teachers are being failed as a result. Anna Campbell-Jones, is it fair that teachers have got to put up with increasing levels of violence in the classroom? Of course, of course it's not. I mean, teachers are the people that are trying to help these kids um, learn stuff and have a, have a good life. I don't think children behave badly at school if they're happy. And I think it's, you know, you're talking about mental health services and that is incredibly important. But actually, if people are mentally ill or more people are becoming mentally ill because of everything that's been going on, you know, that we've talked about already, the pandemic, Brexit, all this uncertainty, war, constant bickering politicians, whatever it is, right? It's, it's a, a climate catastrophe. It's a really stressful, stressful time to be a young person. There's a lot of young people that have been really isolated for a long amount of time, being pitched back into schools, and they're not being supported and looked after. And I think it, it, it's much wider. I think if everybody was happier, then we wouldn't have this problem. Mm -hmm. Lady in the front row. Yeah. I, I, was, I heard the debate on the radio this morning um, and what shocked me was it was taking place in early years education as well, mm. three to five year olds, which I personally didn't um, recognise at the time. But I, I would like to take it to, is the therapeutic education system that we've got working? You can't ask somebody, you can't, ask, you can't say to somebody, you, can't, you need to be violent, you're not allowed to be violent without giving them the education of why they shouldn't be violent. And I think you've got to take that back. And I also think parents have got a big responsibility to take this as well. You shouldn't expect your child to go to school and behave in a way you won't expect them to behave in the house. Um, but I just think we need to look at the system of our education. Is it working? Is the therapeutic system working? Or do we need to make changes okay. at a very, very early stage? Thank you. Alice Drallon. I agree with much of what's been said. I, mean, I know there have been some incidents this week, I think in Renfrewshire, um, which were particularly terrible to, to, to read about. Um, I, I think that um, one thing I would add to what's been said rightly about social media is that uh, teachers themselves face an increasingly hard time on social media and that there are, there are sites set up to have a go at individual teachers and, and teachers in schools. And I think that that raises some big questions about how, as, how we as communities deal with that one. But I think that's the, the one thing I would add to this that hasn't been said is that, that teachers themselves increasingly feel very vulnerable online as well as offline. Uh, gentleman in the white shirt, there. Yeah. Yeah, I do agree. Any violence in the classroom is completely unacceptable, but I think this goes to a wider piece about the lack of investment in education as well. I know the Children's Commissioner recently um, said that the Scottish Government had failed children, and I do agree with that. I think we have completely failed a generation of children, not least with the support after the pandemic, but also just in general in terms of the attainment gap, child poverty. All of these have all... The, the Government has done nothing to close down the gap in any of these areas at all, and this is why you're now seeing this instance and others um, across the education system. Mike Souter. I mean, of course it's absolutely appalling. I think every time you read any of these stories in the paper, it just makes your stomach go over. What we've got, I think, is an increasing generation of young people who feel like they don't belong, who feel disenfranchised, who feel like not part of a community and therefore will find other communities. And those other communities might be on social media or they might be within gangs. Unless there is a, a multi-level, multi-agency approach to this, this isn't just a, this, this is about what government does, but it's also about what the individual does and everything in between. In particular, local government, I think, has an enormous part to play within all of this. And I think it's ironic that today there was a, a, a news item and a report about failings within an underfunded local government as well. Unless we look at this problem holistically, I mean, we can't just wring our hands on this and say, oh, you know, some, somebody's got to do something. I think we all have to take responsibility to put pressure on the people who can, but also ourselves, to stop this happening by embracing that generation, by making sure that they don't feel disenfranchised, by making sure that they appreciate that the community that they've got is this community. They're a part of it. 
they have to feel like they've got a stake in the future. Thank you. Uh, lady down in the front row, on you go. I'm a recently retired head teacher of a primary school and I have noticed over successive years more and more pressure being put on the whole system, education, social work support system, CAMS. I don't know any teachers genuinely after 36 years of working in education who do not go to work each day wanting to provide the best they can for the wide range of children within their care. I also have come across very, very few parents and carers who do not want to do the best they can within whatever situation they find themselves. But circumstances intervene. Our local authority were very good at providing support, but they are being further and further and further stretched and we're meeting with more resistance from children because we can't get supports in place early enough to do the, the early interventions okay, so it and it makes early. it really difficult. It Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, I mean, it's totally unacceptable and it's got to be dealt with. But I think we have to also remember that the overwhelming majority of kids that go to school go there because they want to learn and they want to show respect to the teacher. And... You know, we've got to, you know, highlight that and be positive about that. You know, I know, I'm very fortunate, you know, my two daughters are just coming to the end of their primary school education and they've loved their seven years there. They've had a very positive experience. They've had some great teachers who have taught them and they've learned the values there. And we need to make sure that, that comes through to every pupil and every person who comes to school. I also think we need to look at how much power does the head teacher have in regard to um, looking at who's coming to school and problems that they have. And, and I just think we need to trust the head teacher within local schools. And I personally would give them more responsibility. But we also have to recognise that for lots of reasons, you know, growing up today is a lot harder than it was when I was growing up. And uh, we need to give that help to people, not just with severe mental illness, but those who are really just struggling to know where they fit into the whole scheme. Uh, and that involves, as someone else said, uh, social work, it involves education, yeah. it involves It's everybody. a big picture and it's been very difficult in a lot of schools, I know, since the pandemic as well. We're out of time for this evening. That's it for tonight.